Okay, so a quick look at the schedule. What do we have going on? So remember this week, uh, and thank you, Sarah, for um, uh, asking our blessings. Kind of reminds me of uh, uh, one time where I was singing in some choir, some church choir. The person, you know, prayed for us, you know, like our choir practice, bless us to be able to sing to the best of our abilities. Listen, folks, if you're going to invoke the blessings of the Almighty, don't limit yourself to the best of your abilities. I mean, go for everything, you know, just ask for it all. Uh, so that test runs this that test runs this week, and uh, remember Friday is a late day. You will pay five dollars for the privilege of taking the exam on Friday, if that's really the day you want to do it. Uh, free until then. Ah, oh, boy, it's exam week, and we got homework, and we've got a project uh, due. So kind of a heavy week, I guess. Okay, uh, today we're talking about error handling and debugging. The content for today is not on the midterm. So uh, it ends with what we covered last time we were together. Uh, and we have a file to download. So go ahead and, and uh, download productlist.xlsm. And then we'll, we'll get ready to, to work on this. So, uh, so it turns out there's three really different kinds of errors that we can create. There's one kind of error that is so bad. Uh, it, it's a syntax error, uh, and it's so bad the compiler, or I should say the interpreter that's translating your VBA into machine language to run, looks at it and says, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I just can't do this. I, I, I just don't even know. Uh, and so those are usually pretty easy. To, they're not always easy to fix, but they're pretty easy to find because, um, well, quite often they'll turn red, right? The, all of the syntax errors turn red. Like if you're you know typing away and you make a syntax error, let's take a look. Let me come in here, Alt F11. Oh, looks like I've already got a syntax error built for us here. Oh boy, what is wrong with that? It's got to be something wrong with it because it's showing up in red. What's wrong with it? What's that? A little louder. Yeah, until is spelled incorrectly. I spell until that way about almost half the time I type it, I think. So, so uh, kind of nice that um, uh, it turns red. Let you know there's something wrong with this line. Okay, so we can fix that. So, you know, one might think, boy, uh, but, uh, that syntax errors uh, just always get highlighted in red, but that's not true. So I can make a syntax error, something that's, that's so bad that the compiler can't even compile, can't even, doesn't know what to do with it without putting a red line anywhere. And I can do that just by deleting kind of a required keyword. So there's no loop. That do needs a loop. It's just not there. There's nothing to turn red because the whole line that it needs to, to be there is just uh, incorrect. So if the syntax error, you know, if you've got a statement written there, and even that line all by itself, the interpreter is gone. I have no idea what you're talking about. And it's kind of nice. You'll see that in red. But there are some syntax errors that don't show up in red because you're like missing syntax and there's nothing to highlight uh, that says that there's something that it can see that's wrong. It's because it's missing something. So syntax errors uh, are, in a sense, the, um, they're, they're, they're the worst it, it, at one level because the, the interpreter can't even figure out what you're talking about. Now, we got another kind of error called a runtime error. And a runtime error, everything is syntactically valid. The, the interpreter can look and understand everything that you're saying, um, or, or at least, yeah, maybe it doesn't know what you meant to say, but it, it, it can understand what you actually said. And it goes, yeah, okay, I can, I, can, I can translate that into machine code. But for a runtime error, when the computer actually tries to execute the line, then that fails. Here's an example of runtime error. So let's see. So we've got products dot. Uh, so here's uh, the name of a worksheet here. Let me do this. That's the code name, of course. Let's see, alt, um, view, what is my Project Explorer? Control R. Why my Project Explorer always go as big like that? I don't know. Okay, come on Project Explorer, you can dock. All right, so here's products. It's the sheet name is products and the code name is products. So I'm gonna to refer to this differently. Sheets, worksheets.
It should still be okay. Another way to re refer to that worksheet uh, is just fine. Uh, what is this doing here? Process products. It looks like we're just running through all the products that we have here. So let's just take a quick look at this data. So this data is uh, was actually like product data from a company called outlaw.com. Um, kind of early 2000s, they were an online like uh, sporting goods store. They're, I don't know how long they've been out of business, but before they went out of business, I took a copy of their database just by writing a program to go and kind of go product by product through what they were showing on the web. And uh, this is what that data is. So I think this is just gonna run through and, and print off uh, these. We're printing column six, which is probably the name. So if I was to run this, we should see that just scroll off a bunch of names and some other information. So it's running through all of those just fine. Now, okay, so if I take that quote off, that's gonna cause a syntax error. I'm missing a quote. And it says, hey, you're starting with a quote here. Ah, we get to the end of a quote here. That seems like a strange name for a worksheet. But then it says, wow, just another quote all by itself and it gets confused. So I'll put that back in there. Now let me take off the P. So it's just Rodux. Syntactically, is this valid? Yeah, the syntax is okay. Do, uh, there's a loop until, that's it's all, it's all spelled right. Worksheets, that's spelled right. Now it gets to here and it goes, oh yeah, we're expecting a string inside these parentheses and you've given me a string, that's great. Syntactically, it's fine. It's gonna try to open a sheet called Rodux and that's gonna be a problem because that sheet doesn't exist. So, the, so in this case, this would be a runtime error. That means, that the, the, the interpreter can look at it and figure it out and say, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and try to do that. But when it actually tries to accomplish it, it fails. So runtime errors are different because the code actually starts to execute before the error happens. Whereas with um, syntax errors, it can't even start to execute. Can't even, it, it can't even get started. So runtime errors are a little bit different. Um, and we have some extra tools to deal with runtime errors. Now, usually a, a runtime error like this, uh, we just like to get rid of. Um, but there are some runtime errors that ooh, we can't really get rid of them. And our, our best bet is to say, let's watch what it happens. And if it happens, let's say, okay, you're, you're having a runtime error here. Don't panic. I'll give you something else to do. And so we, that's called an error trap. And we're going to see how to build those today. So um, kind of notice when a runtime error happens and then redirect the interpreter to do something different when that kind of error happens. The third kind of error, the third class of error is uh, in a sense, it's... it's the, the worst kind, because the error isn't in the code at all. The error is in your head as a program. This is called a logic error. In the case of a logic error, you write something and the interpreter says, yeah, I can, I can, I can compile that. And then when it goes to run, it runs just fine, but it doesn't do what you meant it to do. Has that happened to you yet? Yeah, it should have happened. It should happen almost every time. Like, like if you're doing any, any non-trivial project, you're gonna have logic errors that you have to work through and work them out. These are tough because, because with both runtime errors and syntax errors, we often get some indication that says, this is what the problem is. With a logic error, as far as the computer's concerned, there's no problem. It is doing just fine exactly what you told it to do. And so this becomes the, the really tough ones to track down. And so we've got a set of tools that we use to help us track those down. We'll look at some of those today as well. Okay, so um, here's what I'm gonna do here. Instead of having this runtime error to fix, let's do a different kind of runtime error. Okay, what sheets do I have here? I've got a sheet called promos. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna want a new sheet added here called lists. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this code and say, you know, I would, I would like to be able to just kind of scan through this and put the unique set of departments. So one way that I could do that would be like to copy the column, paste it somewhere else, and then do like a remove duplicates or something. And that's a reasonable way to do it. For this example today, what we're going to do is just going to scan through the data and we're going to say, okay, hunting. We haven't seen hunting yet. Let's put that in the list. We get to hunting on the next line, uh, row three, and we go, oh, we've already seen hunting. We don't need to do that one again. Um, and so forth. I just like to make a unique list. And I want to put that on a sheet called lists, which doesn't yet exist. Okay. So uh, we'll be running through this code and I'll leave this, I'll leave this uh, block of code here in place. Uh, and let's build another, maybe I'll go above it. We'll build another sub procedure up here. That's just going to add item. We'll just call this 
add, let's go make a sub called add list item. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take in here a list to add it to as a string, and then an item also as a string. So my sub and my end sub. So we're gonna call add list item and we're going to pass it the list we want to add it to, and we're gonna pass it the value that we want to put onto the list. Now, what add list item should do is it should check um, to find the list that we're talking about, and then it should. Um, check to see if it's there. If it is there, don't do anything. If it's not there, add it. That's kind of the idea. So I'm going to go ahead and call this from inside my loop here. So we're going to add list item and we're going to pass it uh, two values. Let's go ahead and do the one I suggested. So we're going to pass it department. And then as we're going through, we'll pass it everything from column C. So we're going to want to make a list called department. I'll just hard code that. T-M-E-N-T. -E and then the second argument is going to be the item that goes on that. So that should be whatever is in column three or column C. So now as we're going through this, and maybe I'll put this after the debug.print. So if I've got an error, I'll at least be able to see uh, to have printed out which one I'm working on see the row number that I'm working on. And then we're gonna add this item to the list. Now, so now when this gets up here, we should, you know, the first time we come up here, it should be working with, um, what was it, hunting? Yeah, the hunting department. Okay, so here's what I wanna do. Let's just set, let's uh, declare a variable, a, sheet, a variable to refer to a sheet, S as a worksheet. And then let's set S equal to, of all the worksheets, the one called lists. Now, this, this doesn't yet exist, L-I-S-T, L-I-S-T-S. And so I expect this line to fail at this point, because it's referring to a worksheet that doesn't exist. Now, you might look at this and say, well, you know, hey, Professor Allen, why don't you just, you know, create the sheet before? And the answer is, I might want it to, if, if there's no lists, kind of step one would be make a sheet to hold the lists. And then if there's no list called um, department, then, you know, make a column in that sheet called list. It has a product. I kind of want this thing to bootstrap itself. Um, so if I have this code in some place where the worksheet doesn't exist yet, it'll just create it for me. So there's a couple of ways that I could go about deciding, does it need to create the list? What would be one, or does it need to be able to create the sheet to hold the list? What's one way I could do to find out, should I have to create it? How could I, how could I find out if the sheet already exists? There's no function built in to say, does this sheet exist? So if I was going to try to figure out, does this sheet by this name already exist, what could I do? Any thoughts? Oh yeah, I could do that as a human. I could just look and see if there's a sheet called there. But how do I get the code to, to do that looking for me? Go ahead. Ah, oh, so what you're saying is just delete it and then create it. That would work okay if I just for sure needed a blank sheet. But what I have to do here is I say, hey, I'm trying to add an item to the list. And if I've already got the list sheet, I don't want to delete it because I got lots of lists there. Uh, and I got a, that would also cause another problem, and that is if a sheet doesn't exist, if I try to delete it, it's going to fail. Um, although that sounds like a pretty tricky way to trick me into doing the homework that's due tonight right here in class, to just do something that would delete a sheet, okay, um, which we might do anyway. We'll see. Go ahead. Yeah, that's, that would be the way we'd have to do it. So just, just, just iterate across all the worksheets and check one by one to see if the name exists. How many worksheets can I have in a workbook? Like 255. How long would it take to iterate across 255? Oh, you know, it's not that long. It's, it's uh, less than a second for sure. So it wouldn't be a big deal to iterate across them. Um, so that's one thing I could do. So there is a way to do this without what I'm about to show you. But what I'm going to do instead, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say, 
let's just try to create it. Uh, let's just try to refer to it. And if it has an error, then we'll notice it has an error. And instead of dying with that error, we'll say, oh, I guess the sheet didn't exist. Let's go create the sheet. OK, there's a question or a comment in the back. Yeah, that's, yeah that'll, be the, that'll be kind of the other attempt. Now, sometimes, you know, kind of going across these, you know, two, maybe I've got 200 worksheets. Sometimes um, it might take a long time to actually find out if the code that you're going to do is not going to cause an error. And in that case, you might say, you know what? It's going to be faster, quite a bit faster, just to try to do it. And then if it fails, notice it and, and work on. So this is kind of a valid technique uh, uh, to do in programming. OK, so if I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and run my process product right now. And it should fail right here on this line. So I'll hit play. And I'm guessing that you've dealt with this already, right? This is telling me we got, uh, this is error number nine, subscript out of range. I'm going to hit debug, and that will take me right to the line that it, that it tried to execute that it couldn't do. Doesn't mean that's where the error is. That means that's the line that I couldn't accomplish. The error could be somewhere before this. OK. So and one of the things that's kind of neat is that you know if you're kind of looking here and you forgot what the error message is, you can go back and hit the play again. And it'll just try to, it'll try to pick up from where it was. And it'll just show you that same error again, subscript out of range. Now, this is not a very good error because there's no, there really is no subscript involved here. But uh, can I do that while I have a runtime error? Let's just see. What if I was just going to say, work, I want to print the first worksheet. Worksheet one. Worksheets one dot name. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, so. I don't think so. Because of the Hey, Caroline, yeah. why don't you go ahead and mute yourself? I don't know if I can mute you. Oh, she did great. Okay, so ah, so this is referred to as a subscript. Now, if if I could, like back in the early days of programming, I've got a bunch of worksheets, and I'm going to refer to them by number. What I would really like to see, if you can kind of think of like you know some kind of you know academic paper that you read somewhere, where it would say ah, I've got worksheets, and then literally a subscript below it, like sub one, like a little lower one below it to designate this is number one of the worksheets. And I had another one worksheets, you know, with a little lower case two, well, lower case, but a little small two as a subscript. That's how we would like to be able to refer to those. But in it, there, there's no subscripts here. You can't actually put a little two and make it shrink down and go, you've got just regular characters. And so instead we put it in parentheses. And so that's referred to as a subscript. That notation says, what we really mean with, with that one is to make it a subscript. Like, like really in, in typography, if you were to make it a subscript, that's where the term comes from. And so in this case, if I was to put here a 10, I want to go to the 10th worksheet. I want to go to the 10th worksheet and print the name. That really is the right error message. Subscript out of range. There's no subscript. There's no, there's no number 10. Now, you can see why they use the same error for this. It's kind of the same idea, isn't it? You're trying to refer to an item in that set that doesn't exist. There's no subscript in this case, but there is no worksheet with that name. So the name's a little bit, a little bit strange. Now you'll notice that also has a number nine on it. Okay. So we're going to actually make sure that if we're, here's, here's the process. We're going to tell the interpreter, listen, if you run into an error from here on out, if you have an error, just skip it and move on. That's kind of dangerous. Like, let's watch this. Let me just put that line in and then we'll, we'll do what else. If I was to come up here and just say on error, this is, a, this is a directive to the interpreter, on error, if there is an error, what I want you to do, resume, next. Whatever line the error was on, just skip it and move on. That's what that says. Now, this has the very undesirable effect of turning every single runtime error into a logic error. So I will not get a runtime error anymore at all. It'll just say I couldn't run that line. I'll just skip it and move on. And it might make, you know, might be that I can't run the next line either. Great, skip it and move on, skip it and move on. So I'll run this. And let's see, I want to run process products. It runs through all those. It's calling this like 860 times or something. Um, and uh, it had 860 errors, but it just kind of moved on. So we're going to be really careful with this statement. And we are going to only use that in really, really tight proximity to the line that we think is going to be problematic. So instead of putting it right up here at the top, 
I'm going to come down right before the line that I think might fail. So I'm saying, listen, if the next line fails, just skip it and move on. And then I'm going to check. I'm going to say if err dot number. So um, err is an object that has information about what runtime error might have been suppressed by an, a previous on error statement. What error number did this cause? Do you remember what number it was? Number nine, it's like, hey, it's a great one because today is Valentine's Day. It's like love potion number nine. So error, uh, if error number equals nine, then we're gonna do something. And if, uh, and then I'm gonna put this statement in on error, go to zero. This is a bizarre line. So bizarre that it deserves a comment all by itself. This line here says, um, re revert to normal error handle, revert to normal error behavior. Okay, so this line says, hey, if there's an error, skip it and move on. So these two are like a pair. And although this isn't, isn't really a kind of a formal block, it's really common to see things inside of this block kind of tabbed in so you can see the block a little bit better. It turns out in the very early days of basic, it was, it was terrible. You had to number the lines. Like if you're saying, I want to you know, write, a, this is line number one. And the next line you would put a two at the beginning. This is line number two. You could skip them too. You could, the next one is line number 10, as long as they were increasing in number. Here's line number 10. And what happens if you wanted to go put uh, something in between number, number, line number one, line number two? You'd have to renumber everything after it. It was, it was the worst. There were whole programs like to renumber your code for you. But the very first executable line number was line number one. And so in basic, when you said to, to do something referring to line number zero, that's an impossibility. There is no line number zero. And so by saying, hey, if there's an error, just go up to line zero and start running, you're, you're trying to do something it can't do. And it, I have no excuse for why this is why we say it, but that's the way that we say, all right, go back to your normal way that you would handle an error. Um, and so now if I have a runtime error after this statement, then it's gonna stop the code and it's gonna put up the message box right here in my development environment. If I have a runtime error before this statement, it'll stop the code, but anywhere between this, it's just gonna move on. So, and so what I'm saying is I'm anticipating there being an error on this line. If there is, keep right on going because then I'm gonna to check to see if it's error number nine. Uh, then what am I gonna say? Right now, I'm just gonna say debug.print uh, error. And then maybe just to kind of show you that we can get at that error message, I can say err.message, no description. And so it's gonna tell me what is it, subscript, uh, subscript out of range, I think is what the message is. So now I'm calling this like 860 times in my code. It's going to print that error message 860 times. Let me go ahead and run it. It's taking a while to get there. But after each line that it prints off, it's telling me, hey, error subscript out of range. Okay. So now what I'm saying is I'm anticipating error number nine. If, if, if there's an error and it's number nine, I know exactly what's going on here. I can do something. If it's some other error that I may not be anticipating, then I still want, kind of want it to behave the same way. So, but let's go ahead and, and deal with error number nine before we look at, at how would we treat something else in case it's not number nine. What do we want to do if it's error number nine? What should we do in this case if it is error number nine? So right here, instead of printing it, what are we gonna do? Let's create the sheet. Worksheets.add. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and set 
S equal to worksheet set F. Listen, we tried to set it to the existing sheet. That failed. So we're going to set it to a brand new worksheet. And then we're going to use that variable to change the name. So the name of that newly created worksheet, which will be something like sheet number one or sheet number 47 or something. S dot name is going to be equal to lists. The sheet didn't exist. So we're going to create it. Now, by the time we get to here now, so now we know, well, we're pretty sure that S is bound to the list sheet because either it bound it here, in which case there will be no error and we won't hit this, or it will um, not find it. It'll cause an error. We'll come in here, create the sheet, name it list. Either way, at the end, S is going to be referring to the sheet that we're after. Um, just because I don't really want to call this 800 times to test it, let me set up a little, um, this is kind of a neat little trick for debugging. I'm going to create another sub procedure up here. I'm going to call it my Acme, A-C-M-E, sub runner. Uh, and I'm calling it Acme because I want it to be alphabetically small. Um, and it's even below add list items, so that's good. And so here, let me just make the call, rather than working from inside that loop, let me just make the call here and pass it the values I'm interested in while I'm debugging. So department and hunting. So that's the, that's the first one that it should call. But now if I run my Acme sub runner, then it'll just run once instead of 800 times. Um, so I'd be able to see it work. Now, kind of the, one of the nice things here is that because I've named this alphabetically small, if I'm on this one, if I'm doing my work down here, and I say run, what is it going to do? If I'm, if I'm on this one and I say run, what's the problem? It's not going to run my add list item. Why won't it? Let me go, I'll just go ahead and try it. So I'm down here working on this and my insertion point is in here. I'm going to hit play. And it says, I don't know what you're, what you're trying to run, but you can't run the one you're on. Why can't I run the one I'm on? That's right. It's expecting these two variables to be defined. These are parameters. And for, the, for me to be able to run this, I've got to give these two values. So it says, listen, you can't run this one. So here's the other ones that you, can, that you want to run, that you, can, that you can choose from. So because I've named that, that one I'm using just for debugging, Acme, it's alphabetically the first one here. That's nice, because what that means is that's going to be the one that comes up selected. So if I'm here, I can just press F5 and then hit Enter, and it will run the code. It'll run that, that default one that I'm after. Now, that should have created the sheet. Yeah, here it is. It's created a sheet called lists. So if everything is well, I should be able to run this again. It won't try to create another sheet, won't have another error, um, because my list sheet already exists. So. I'm feeling pretty good about that. This is what's referred to as an error trap. I'm saying I'm expecting a runtime error might happen here. So let me just see if it does happen. And if so, let me give it some other guidance. Questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, is this just a way to find the error so you can get rid of it? Or is this something you might actually leave in production? And the answer is, this is something you might leave in production. Yeah, so, um, and the reason is, so, so in this case, you know, I'm only looking through, um, I'm looking through sheet names. I can get to the sheet names pretty quickly. But let's suppose that what I'm creating is I'm gonna be creating a workbook that has a particular name. And so now it's not just reading the sheets, which are already going to be in memory very fast to access. Now I'm going to have to check to see, does that file exist at the, in the operating system? So now I'm like going, I got to iterate across the files that are in this folder. And I got to see, does, is there already a file with this name? That could take a while. And so it might be dramatically faster. And by dramatically faster, I mean, um, I mean like orders of magnitude, but we're only talking about maybe the difference between a second or two. You know, it might take a couple of milliseconds as opposed to two seconds. That's a, that's a huge difference in the percentage wise. Um, to say, you know what, just, just, let's just, let's just try to make it. And if it fails, then we'll know that we need to change the, that we need to change the name. Yeah, no, it looks okay. Yes.
yeah, how come we're not putting parentheses around this? This is one of the, this is the bane of my existence in teaching VBA. It's a decision that the guys made like in 1995 or earlier when they're making this language. Uh, and they said, listen, if you're not doing anything with the value that comes back from the, from the function or subprocedure that you're calling, no parentheses go around it. And so, yeah, we're, this, is, this is not a function procedure. If it was a function, it would send something back. And if it was a function, and if I was doing something with what it sent back, I would need to put parentheses around it. But because it's just a call to a subprocedure, not going to send anything back, and, and would also apply if it was a function procedure that I wasn't using the return value, then I don't put parentheses around the argument. In almost every language that is, is in common use today, you put parentheses around argument lists regardless of how you're using them. But when they make the language um, back in the 90s, I thought, you know, there's really no reason to put parentheses around this, and so let's not do it. They, they have repented for that. This was a mistake when they made the language. And like the current versions of Visual Basic, visualbasic.net, it's, it's, it's the way you're saying. It is put parentheses around every argument list. It's a different time. In the 90s, it, weren't, it wasn't like the 70s. The 70s was terrible. They had big hair. We had bell-bottom jeans and such. 90s wasn't so bad, but they still made some mistakes. This is one of them. Yeah, problem with the 90s. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when, we're, when, we, when we create a function, the whole purpose of that function was to send a value back, right? The example that we did was like to do the ISBN 10-digit validator. It's going to return true or false based on what you gave it to me. So it's, it's saying, hey, I need something back. Now, in this case, we don't need something back. We want it to just go and do something. What do we want it to do? Well, we're going to give it this value, and it's going to write it somewhere onto this worksheet for us. That's the idea here. And so... Um, when it's done, you know, what we might say is, you know, send back true or false if it was successful or not or something. We could convert this into a function to go and do something and then let us know if it succeeded. But um, it's really common just to say, no, this is just some code I want to go and do. And I'm not really looking for it to send anything back. And so, yeah, it's a little bit different here. Yeah. And, and the truth is, Anytime you've got um, that kind of block of logic that's just going and doing something, you could write that. I could write this, whatever I'm about to do it here in my add list item, I could write that logic right here inside this loop. The reason that I don't do it that way is, you know, this is, this is kind of like a, a kind of an encapsulated little part of the process. So I'm going to set it off somewhere else so I can say, you know, when I'm doing that part, I know it's happening in this separate procedure here. It kind of isolates that functionality, makes it a little bit easier for me to maintain. But the real reason is, is that if I have to have add items to list from multiple different places, I don't want to have to duplicate that code in multiple places. I want to have that in one place, and then I want to call it from different places so that if I, when I have to maintain it and update it, I only have to change that code in one place. That's the real reason that we want to kind of segment our code into different procedures. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We cannot call a sub procedure from out, over in Excel. It's only available to us to be invoked from other places in VBA. That's exactly correct. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. We got some tools. Okay. So this, oh, okay. So the next step is well, what if, you know, how are we going to deal with it if it's some error besides number nine? I can't imagine what it would be besides number nine in this case. But here's, here's one that, that could be different. Let's say, I'm, uh, let's say I'm trying to delete a worksheet. So if I'm trying to delete a worksheet, my code to delete a worksheet could fail for a couple of reasons. Number one, if I try to refer to a sheet um, that doesn't exist and just say I want to delete that sheet, that's a runtime error. That's, that's runtime error number nine, incidentally. Um, but if I try to refer to a sheet, I'm saying I want to delete this worksheet, and I've spelled the name right, and there is a worksheet with that name, it might fail for a different reason. What's the reason? 
What's the other reason that a worksheet could fail? Uh, me, let's just do it real quick. So here's, uh, here's a workbook with only um, one worksheet on it. Alt F11. Let me find my new book one. Don't do this, just watch this one. Insert a module. Oh, that's the wrong kind of module. Don't, do, don't insert that one. Shoot. On this insert module. Um, worksheets, sub sheet one, dot delete. Let's do sheet two. If I try to delete sheet two, now we got two workbooks open, so let me go ahead and save this workbook. Because this is gonna be, this tells me the workbook that this code is built into, which is book number one. Uh, that's gonna fail because subscript header writing. There is no worksheet one. So that's error number nine. But okay, so let me change it to this one. That's gonna fail as well. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure it's gonna fail. Um, close the workbook without saving. This will close the workbook without saving. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, this, has, this has changed. I can close the workbook. Uh, hold on just a second. Let me just, I'm gonna make, let me save this separately. I'm not sure why it's behaving that way. And it, it still it still may have an error for me. Let me save this code. XLSM. Ah, there we go. Okay. This was behaving a little bit strange because I hadn't saved it. It's saying, listen, you haven't even saved this workbook yet. You're deleting the last sheet. I guess you didn't want anything here. That was really kind of strange. But here now, when I try to run it, it says, hey, at least one, a workbook must contain at least one visible worksheet. The last one was error number nine. This is error number 1004. Wow, I got a lot of errors that we got from nine to 1004. Um, so this was saying you're, you're not allowed to delete the last visible worksheet. It's a different error. I want to behave differently based on those two things. Um, and so in this case, um, we could do that. This, by the way, is your homework. Have you done the homework already? What would I have to do? No, but the homework says, the homework says, listen, if, if um, it's really interesting to say, I want to delete a worksheet, and if the sheet is, doesn't exist, that's going to cause it to fail, right? The very condition I'm trying to achieve, that worksheet not existing, is causing my code to fail. And so in this case, I'd like to say, listen, if it, if it fails, just move on. What should I do? There's like one little line of code I can add here that would just make it behave that way. What is it? On error, remove, resume next. Just try to delete it if you can, great. If not, also great. You know, it's, it's not there. Okay, that's the homework. So you could probably do the homework real quick. Uh, so, but let me go come back to the other code that we're writing. And have that same situation here. We're anticipating error number nine. Um, and now I want to behave differently if it's some other error. So let's do this. I'll say, if it's error number nine, do that. Else, that will do it this way. Else, if my error number is different from zero. What do you suppose error number zero is? Error number nine is subscript out of range. Uh, error number five is type mismatch. What's error number zero? If you were to guess, or if you were to have read the chapter. Yeah. Ah, so go to error, go to line zero is what turns back on the, the error handler, the default error handler. Error number zero is there's no error at all. So my, if my error object has a number of zero, it's saying I haven't encountered an error. There's no currently actively set error. So now what I'm gonna say is, listen, if, uh, if it's error number nine, do this special. What do I wanna do if it's error number zero? What's that? 
oh, I'm not, maybe make it active. Actually, whatever I want to do if there's no error is what's going to happen down here. There's lots of stuff I want to do if there's no error or if I've held, handled the error correctly. The point is that inside my error trap, if there's no error, there's nothing to do. And so if it is error number zero, you know, so what I'm saying is if it's error number nine, handle it specifically. If it's anything else other than zero, so some other error number, then we're not really, we weren't anticipating this. We don't, we don't know what this is for. And so we've got to do something here to tell the user that, you know, we've got the error. And so uh, we might just put a message box here. Uh, you know, kind of do the same thing. Um, error, and then that would be the, uh, well, that's the message. We're going to fix that. We're going to make this critical, and then we'll put the title error. And then maybe what we'll say here is error, and then concatenate on my error number. And then concatenate on a colon in a space, and then concatenate on the description. Now I've got a syntax error here somewhere. And then this is actually an in-class exercise to see if you can tell me where my syntax error is. Yep. Yes. Yes, you got it. I actually put them there out of habit, but you're right, they don't belong. Um, so get rid of the parentheses, and that should be okay. And now the one thing we're going to do is if that sheet, whatever that error was, we're not sure what it is, we better not just let it go and run the rest of our code. So here, I'm going to say exit uh, sub. So when we're dealing with the sheet, if it's the error that we're anticipating, we know what to do. We're going to add the sheet. If it's uh, if it's zero, we want to skip it. So that's why we have this other else if it's so if it's it's not nine and now it's something besides zero, we're going to put up a message box and we're going to um, give that to the user and then we're going to be done with our code. We're done with this sub procedure. Get me out of here. Question. Ah, so why exit sub instead of end sub? So exit sub, if I, my end sub has to match up one for one for my sub statement. So I can't just say end sub. Now, I could say end, and that would terminate all VBA. I don't want to say end because I don't want you to teach you to get too comfortable with end. Because if you put end in an assignment that my grader is going to work with, what language is my grader written in? VBA. And so if you put an end statement, not only does it end your code, it ends the grader. Yeah, you can't submit if, you, if your code actually executes through an end statement because it'll just stop the grader, the whole submission process. So we're going to say exit sub. Now, actually, you're, but you're right, though. This is a problem because the whole point here is it's going to be called from inside of, inside of this. And so um, exit sub isn't going to kind of stop. It's just going to stop this particular one. And that may be OK, depending on what I'm after. So what if I wanted to stop everything in this case? Don't just stop this one, but stop everything without using an end. Well, what I might do is I might, instead of making this a sub procedure, I might make it a function procedure that returns true or false. True meaning it was successful, false meaning it was not successful. And then where I call it from, I could say, well, hey, if this evaluates the false, then you know, get me out of this one as well. Um, my other possibility is to, is to actually just say, you know what, that error that I suppressed, let's re-raise the error. Let's just, you know, if, if it's number nine, we're going to deal with it. If it's number zero, there's nothing to deal with. If it's anything else, let's just raise it again. Hmm. So let's go ahead and do that. Oops, long language, comment, single quote. Oh, let's see if I can remember how to raise an error in VBA. ERR, it's just ERR.raise, I think. Yeah. So there's a, so the error object has a, a method saying, hey, you know what? This is a suppressed error. Just raise the error again. I'm going to give it the number, ERR.number. And 
The next one is hmm, source. I'm not sure what the source is. The descriptions err dot description. Oh, there's actually it has a source parameter. So whatever it is, it's right here. Err dot source. So I should just be able to re-raise that, and that should just so that should then just do the the built-in error handler, even though I'm still kind of inside this on error block. Let me just see if I can get that to invoke by making this number eight. So if I if I I'm going to make it so that it has error number nine. I'm going to only check for number eight and number zero, and we'll see what this raise looks like. So to get that, I've got to not have a list sheet here. So let me go ahead and delete this. Is there a question? I'll run my code. And I kind of expected that to raise the air. The truth is I don't often um, do this. So let's just try it one more time. Yeah, so I'm not raising. I might have to turn off the error handler here as well. Let's try that. Yeah, there we go. Um, error number five, invalid procedure call. Error number eight. Hmm. Anyway, that's something along that lines. I expect that to be number nine. I'm not sure why it's not, but let's not spend any more time. So I'm going to end this and take this back to number nine. And I really am not expecting it to be anything else. So I don't think I'm going to worry about that other code. This kind of gets you the idea of an error trap. Questions here? OK, so at this point, I've shown what I wanted to show with this example. We haven't actually made this thing add the list. Do you want to, it's like choose your own adventure today. Do you want to build out the rest of this example so we can actually see it build the list or kind of go on and look at more of the other uh, error handling tools that we have? Who says, let's finish off this example. I'm not going to take the rest of the class. It'll take about another five minutes. You saying, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Who's saying, no, 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 let's just go look at the other tools. That's about even. So let's go ahead and finish this example off. Okay, so we're passing in a list that we want to add it to and we're passing it the value that we want to put on here. So let's say that on this sheet, let's run this again and create the sheet again. On this sheet list, we're gonna put the name of the list right here in row number one. So step one, we're gonna check to see, does the list exist? Does the list name exist in this, in this row? So let's do that. Number one, see if the list exists. So let me dim found cell as a range set found cell equal to our sheet s dot rows sub one. We're looking only in the first row dot find. And we're looking for the list name, which is just called list. And we want to find the whole, the whole cell with that. So X L W H O L E W X L W H O L E. So this argument here is like look after. This is what are we looking in? I think, and this is what we're looking at. So we're trying to find a cell where the whole contents of the cell matches the list that was passed in. So. If, if that's successful, it's going to bind found cell onto the cell that it found. If it's not, then it's going to be blank. So I'm going to say if, or it's going to be, it'll be unset. It won't be set to any object. If found cell is nothing, then we want to do something here. E-N-D-I-F. So this means the list that doesn't exist. So I'm just going to add this at the end uh, of 
uh, the column. So let me go ahead and give myself another variable here to keep track of which column I'm working on. I will call this call, C-O-L, as an integer. So now I'm gonna set my column equal to, and then we're gonna look at S dot cells, row number one, column number. I wanna look at the very last column in this row. So columns dot count. And from there, I wanna do an end and move back to the left. And not in quotes, it's constant, XL to left. So we're not quite done with this line yet. What this is saying is going all the way over to the rightmost column and then move to the left until you bump into something. Now that's gonna actually refer to the cell that's got data in it. So I actually want to refer to the column that that is and I want to add one onto it. So this, it's kind of a long line. It says, look at our sheet and go to a particular cell. Which one is it? It's the very last cell of the first column. Then from there, do like control left. Where would that take you? And then whatever column that is, I want to add one onto it. And so that's the column I'm going to be working on. But since I didn't find my label here, I need to write the name of the list into that cell. So cells, row number one, column number call, dot value is gonna be equal to my list. So I'm looking for the um, department. I didn't find it. So figure out the column to put it in and then actually write list there. And column now is gonna to refer to that particular one. Now, if it did, if my, if, my, um, if my find actually found it, then it's gonna bind find cell, found cell onto the column, which it had. So I'm gonna to have to, in the case, so here's where it didn't exist, down here is where it did exist. Then here I'm gonna say S, I'm sorry, call is gonna be equal to the column of the found cell. I'll see O L at the end. So at this point, I have the column C O L U M N. I have the column of the list in so now I just I want to do something really similar to looking in the column. I want to see if the value I'm looking for already exists in the column. If it does, nothing to do. If it doesn't, I want to add it to the column. So I'm going to use my found cell again. We'll set found cell equal to s dot columns number call, whichever one I'm looking for, what am I going to find? Now I'm looking for my value. Did I call it value? I called it item. This is going to have a little bit of a defect here because if I'm looking for an item that has the same name as the list, it's going to find it on the first row. Let's not worry about that. It's kind of an unusual situation. You could probably fix it without too much trouble, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of more time on it. Okay, once again, we're just going to check if found cell is nothing, then we're ready to write, we're ready to write the value on. So I'll do something similar to what I did going all the way to the end and looking to the left. Here, I'm gonna go all the way to the bottom and look up. So I'm gonna say S dot cells. What row do I want? Rows dot count. What column do I want? Column call, one that we're working on. From there, I wanna do an end, XL up. From there, I'm gonna offset one row 
and set the value of that cell equal to item. So I went looking for it. If I didn't find it, I'm going to figure out the place I want to put it, and I'm going to write it right onto that location. I think that's it. Ooh, could we, we might, you know, if it's, if it's not it, we'll need some of other debugging tools, which is great because that's what we're learning about today. So I'm going to go ahead and add, I'm going to run this once with my little runner here, and we'll see how that goes. No error, but hopefully it put hunting in that value right there. Now I'm going to run the rest of my whole code. So I'll come down to the loop, process the whole thing. And I think there's only like four different departments. And there they are. Found them all and then put them on there um, onto that list. Okay, that was seven minutes, a little bit longer than I anticipated. Any questions here? Okay, so that's handling the error. Um, that's handling runtime errors. Now we've got a bunch of tools for helping us track down logic errors. Let's take a look at, at what some of those are. So one we've been using since the very first uh, day of class and that's the immediate window. Now the, to really understand how to use the immediate window for debugging, let me go ahead and put in a breakpoint. I'm gonna put a breakpoint in right here. Now it's probably, it's, I'm guessing that for many of you, you have accidentally clicked in this gray margin and you've got this dot with a red line and you thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? You clicked on it again, it went away and you went, ah, oh, did that happen? Who, who has that happened to? Oh, okay, so a few of you, good. So what a breakpoint is, is it says, listen, when you run um, code, in fact, let's, let's not do it there, let's do it, let's do it here. It's saying, all right, when this code runs, when it gets to this line, before it executes this line, stop executing and take me into break mode. My code can be in one of any of three conditions. One condition is design mode, and that's where I'm just writing it. Two, it can be in run mode. That's when the code is actually running. Three is like halfway between those two. That's break mode. <coughs> in break mode, I can come in and edit my code, but the code is technically still running. It's, it's actually, um, because when I go to run this sub procedure, the interpreter says, okay, I gotta, I gotta compile this. It actually compiles that sub procedure. So I'm gonna run this sub procedure. It translates it and kind of gives that to the, um, to the environment to be able to run. And then, it's, it puts, it builds these variables. It makes S, it allocates memory for that. It's gonna allocate memory for column here. It's gonna allocate memory for found cell. And then all that memory is allocated and the values that I've put in there are still there. When I hit this breakpoint, it then stops. Now at this point, I can look and see what are in those variables. So I'm gonna go ahead and run my code up to this point. Okay, so now here I am in break mode. I can kind of still see I've got my, my little breakpoint is behind it. But now in my immediate window, I could come up here and say, well, well, what is the value of call? So I can, I can now kind of ask, what are the values that I've got suspended in memory right now? Because as soon as this code runs out and hits this end sub, it says, hey, I'm done with the things that I declared in here. And it, it gives that memory back to the operating system. We say, hey, we're done with the memory. Thanks, thanks, operating system, for giving us some memory. We're done with it. And so I can't check to see what those values are. But when I'm in break mode, I can kind of stop and take a look. That's good. Not only that, I can change values here as well. Call equals 34. Now I look at calls, equal 34. And that actually should put hunting in column 34. 34 is too far to scroll over to. Let me set it to, let me set it to three. Uh, call equals three. So now if I run this code on from here, just hit play again, I was kind of expecting that column to be three. So it was three, but why didn't it actually put it in three? If found cell is nothing. Let's try that again. And this actually, um, I really did expect that to put it in three. I don't know why it didn't. So that kind of introduces me to kind of my next thing. And that is to be able to step through code one line at a time and see what happens. 
So let's go ahead and just step. Now, the way I step is on the debug toolbar, I've got these three, step into, step over, and step out. They do similar things. Um, and, and, and the only time that the first two are different, step into and step over, is if I'm actually on a call to a sub procedure. So let's, I'm gonna stop this and I'm gonna come back to my Acme sub run. I'm gonna put a breakpoint right on this one. So I'm running my Acme sub runner and this is gonna be a call to a, to a sub procedure. If I say step into at this point, debug, step into, it's saying, oh, you're calling another procedure here. If I say step into, I wanna go step by step through that procedure. So I'll say step into, which is F8. I'll use the F8 key next. And step eight or step into is taking me line by line through the one that I'm, that I'm looking at. I'm gonna turn off the breakpoint here for a second and kind of keep going. Now, what step out does, step out says, oh, I stepped into a sub procedure. I don't really wanna to step to the rest of this. Just take me, finish off this sub procedure and take me back to whatever called this sub procedure. So if I do here, step out, it's just gonna finish this one off and take me back to where it was called from. So step out finishes this one and I move on without going step by step. Now I'm gonna, it turns out I can drag that yellow arrow to where I want it to go. So I'll drag it up here. And this time I will do step over, debug step over. Now you might think that step over is like like, I mean, if I saw something on the road I didn't want to step in, what would I do? I would step over it. I would skip past it. That's not what step over does. Here, step, step over says, execute that whole procedure, but don't step through it. Just run the whole thing. So step over is not going to skip anything. It's just the question, are you going to go step by step through it? So step over, we'll see. We'll go ahead and run that whole thing and then take me to the next one. Okay, so let's... I'm gonna go ahead and step back into this one. Step into, debug, step into. Now, here I am in this one, and I'm thinking, you know what? I don't really wanna run all step-by-step step through all of this, especially if I've got some kind of a loop that's gonna go through a thousand times, and I don't wanna step through that loop. So I could set a breakpoint and then set it to run again, or let's see, where was it that I set the found cell, set found cell equal to, oh, that's why my set found cell didn't work. I'm gonna go ahead and do it and we'll see why. Okay, I, I could set the breakpoint here and just say run, it'll stop at this breakpoint. Or I could say right click and I could say run to cursor. So my cursor's right there. I don't wanna go through all the trouble of setting a breakpoint. I can just say run to cursor and then it will just, it'll run all the way down to there as if there was a breakpoint on that line. Eh, just kind of, that's not a big deal to learn that because you could always just set a breakpoint and get there. Okay, so now I'm gonna set column equal to three. What's my column equal to? Column is three right now, that's what it is. Okay, so I told you, I thought that should, you know, write this value into column three, but it didn't. So now I'm gonna step line by line and just see what happens. So I'm gonna step with F8 and now found cell. I kind of expect found cell to be nothing, uh, but it's not nothing. What is found cell? Hmm, I wonder what found cell is. B1, didn't I just set the column to three? Why did it go to column two, column B? I'm gonna drag my insertion point back up there. I'm gonna set column to three again. And now I'm gonna execute just one line, F8. What's column? Actually, column's nothing yet. What's my found cell address? Found cell is B1. Now, the reason is because when I stopped here and I set column to three, found cell hadn't been set yet. So column is, I mean, I'm gonna set found cell, I'm gonna check it right here. If I wanted to override what column was, I would have to make that change after I got to this point. So I can see if I F8 through here, column is equal to the found cell column. So that's where the column gets set back to two. So if I look at what column is, it's two right here. So now if I set it to three by executing this line, 
and then run the rest of this at pound cell, then this should go with the column being three. That one I'm pretty sure is gonna write it into three and it did. Okay, so I, I can kind of get it halfway. So you know what, I'd like to kind of just change the value right here and see what happens. I can do that when I'm in break mode. We've seen another way to set a breakpoint in class. What's the way that I can put a breakpoint actually in code? It's a four letter statement. What's the statement? Stop, yeah, stop is just a breakpoint. It's written into the code. So that if I was to save my, save my code and open it up again, it would still be there. A breakpoint that I set this way, if I close and reopen, that breakpoint's gone. Okay, so that's kind of using the immediate window and breakpoints. Oh, there's another really powerful thing that I um, want to teach you about, also kind of goes hand in glove with breakpoints, and that's a different window called the locals window. So let me choose view locals window. Oop. And I'm going to bring this up to the top. In fact, maybe I'll put it off to the side here. Doc here. Locals immediate. I kind of like it to go. Maybe I'll just let it float. Unless I can get it to dock parallel here. No, I'll let it float. So again, I'm going to run my code until it hits my breakpoint. I'll run the sub runner. I'll run this one again. Okay, so now what this locals window does, I'll zoom in on it. What the locals window does is it shows me all of my locally declared variables. So I've got list and item here, department and hunting. It just like shows those values all the time. Then on my work, whoa, I did not expect that to go away when I clicked on it. Okay, let me get out of the zoom. <laughs> that was kind of fun. Stop that and run it again. Oh, I can't stop. I'm doomed and I don't know why. I'm not in a loop. I think that's just a little bug that I came across. Did anyone else click on, did anyone else actually get to that plus and click on it and have it not do this? Anyway, the locals window just shows you the values. You can kind of see them as they change. So as you go step by step, uh, it, you'll see them go. Uh, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to like restart Excel to get out of this. When's the last time I saved it? I don't know. So, um, yeah, I'm doomed. So that's the locals window. The locals window is handy because you can you don't have to go and debug.print one at a time to see it. It'll just actually show them to you right there. I uh, don't often use the locals window in class because I totally learned how to work in VBA for, for more than a decade before I even knew the locals window existed. And so it doesn't come um, naturally to me to pop it open. Um, but the nice thing is, like, as you're going step by step, you can watch all the variables change and you can just see them go as they, as they go. Okay, there is, oh, it's waiting for the application to complete. Ole application. Ole. Must be in Spain. It's gone for, to Pompano for the running of the bulls. Um, wonderful. Close all windows. Is this window. All right, I guess I'm gonna just briefly tell you about the last one. And that's a thing called uh, a, a watch. So um, locals shows you all of your variables and that might be okay if you've just got a few. But what if you've got dozens, It'd be like this huge list? So the other one that you can do, and we can't see it, I'll just introduce it to it, is called a watch expression. So I could like right click on a variable and say add a watch expression. And then I have a window called watches and then it's only the variables that I've said I wanna watch. So local shows them all. The immediate window lets you do one at a time. The watch window is kind of in between. It lets you say exactly the ones that you wanna see. And you can actually make expressions besides variables. So they, they could be more complex than just variables. Okay, folks, that's the main waterfront on debugging and error handling. Any questions? So exciting, I agree. All right, that's it then for today. Class dismissed. <laughs>